All right, welcome to our first video lecture. This is lecture number one, where we I will be talking about examining distributions. I say we because you can see me on the screen. I've decided to include myself because the research says that this will help you to be more engaged. It will help me to present the material, um, even though, you know, there might be times when I do this. I might do that. Might get some unflattering angles, but that's okay. It should keep you attentive, should keep you interested. Um, and I look forward to starting this video lecture series with you. All right, the outline for today's lecture is the idea really behind this is what do you do when you receive that data set? So you receive some spreadsheet, uh, maybe you've gathered it yourself, maybe you gave it, you, you know, you received it from uh, a professor or somebody else. And the idea is what do we do once we receive that um, within the context of education? Um, so I'll talk about displaying distributions with graphs. So how do we use graphical re representations to understand these data? And how do we then describe the distributions using numbers? And finally, that'll lead us towards density curves and normal distributions. So that's the outline for this lecture. So I think it's important to start this lecture with thinking about the idea of data and what are data. Um, from your text, it says data are numbers with context, and we need to understand the context if we are to make sense of the numbers. Um, of course, researchers and scholars have been studying data use for many years now, and Ikamoto and Marsh and later Marsh alone uh, kind of posited this framework of a data user where you see the data that has been accessed and collected, you know, it, can be translated to information once it's organized and filtered and analyzed. And then once you combine that with your own prior knowledge and your own understanding and expertise, that's when it becomes knowledge. And that of course might lead you to action and to some outcomes. And then that's a cyclical response which can feed you back to data. So this is just one simple model that somebody's thinking of, what are data? How are they being used in context and practice? Um, and there are many that we can draw on. But I think it's important for you just to stop and really think about, well, what are data? What types of information are out there? And then in our course, of course, we're going to be focused in, on quantitative representations of data. In this slide, I'm trying to present an overview of how today's lecture is going to fit into the broader context of the class itself. So um, we know there are, the, the goal of this class is to gain a better understanding of some of the steps we can take when we want to analyze data to answer the research questions that we have. So here's a process to think about doing that. The first one is, what are the data set's key features and properties? Or what are the sample characteristics that I have in my data set? Second, you want to get to know the variables in the data set, including their attributes and their properties. Third, you can create pictures to better understand the variables. And then those, you can start to begin to examine the relationships that might exist among them using graphical representation. And then finally, we can, from those pictures or through the variables, we can create tables of numbers that will build off and reinforce our visual findings. Now, this is all descriptive, um, but it's giving you a sense of the data set that you have and how we can use descriptive statistics to better understand uh, the sample that you've collected. So let's start with that first one. What are the key features of a data set or its sample properties? A sample is a set of data collected from a population using some defined pr procedure, and that could be a random procedure or a non-random procedure. Often when we think about uh, samples, we think about that random selection. So you grab the phone book and you're going to grab every 10th person, and those are the people you're going to call the sample. Uh, you could be more systematic about that and say, well, I want to define a certain population that I'm going to pick from in doing that, but randomly select from within that. So there are different ways to stratify and to systematically sample uh, in a random fashion. A non-random fashion may be that you're my class right now and I, you're my sample because it's a sample of convenience. Or I want to be more purposeful in the types of people I pick, so I don't want it to be random at all. In fact, I'm going to select specific people that play key roles within the state, for example, if that's my research question around uh, state-level policy. Um, so I'm going to pick those people non-randomly to have them be included in my sample. 
So important sample properties to consider are the unit of analysis. And this is really the who or the what that's included in your sample. In general, in our field, those are individuals. So it could be individual students. It could be teachers. If you're at the district or state level, maybe that's schools that you're looking at. If you're at the national level, it may be states. But it's what's that unit of analysis, kind of the lowest level that you get within your data set. And then it's what's the statistical unit. So one member of that data set as defined by this unit analysis. So is that one school or one student? Um, and then if we combine all those, that's how we get our sample size or how many observations we have in our data sets. And then, of course, a data set isn't just going to be a series of observations, but it's also going to include some variables associated with that unit of analysis. So that might be the characteristics of the students in our school, maybe their school performance. Um, but those are the variables that make that up. And these can be both observable, those things that show up in our data set, but I think it's also important even at this early stage to think about those unobservable characteristics or variables of the sample that may not be included in your data set, but certainly factor into the relationships you're going to examine. All right, so what I'd like you to think about is the variables that are in this picture. So if you look through the group that we have here, uh, I want you to pause the video for just a minute and think through and list down on a piece of paper uh, what are some variables that are found in this picture. All right. Now, having done that, some of the variables that you might have listed could be uh, gender, it could be age, it could be occupation, it could be race, ethnicity. Those are kind of the big ones that, uh, that I see here in this picture. Those are all variables that describe this sample here in this picture. Now, it's important to distinguish between variables and their attributes. So this table is just helpful to organize our thinking in these two areas. So the variables that we discussed could have been gender, it could be age, they could be race, ethnicity, they could be social class. Those are kind of the broader variable or the broader bucket that captures the attributes within that. So for gender, it may be uh, female, male, trans or transgender, other, etc. Uh, age might be young, middle-aged, old. It could be a uh, number that you're using there and you're actually capturing the number of years, how old they are. Uh, race, ethnicity, we could have those categories. Social class, lower, middle, upper. But these are all attributes that help describe those variables. Now, when we think about quantitative information, we generally have two broad categories that the uh, information falls into. We have categorical and continuous measures, and those can even be broken down further into four levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. And it's important at the beginning when you first have your data set and you're starting to understand the unit of analysis, and then you're looking at the variables and its attributes, so how are things measured within this, it's good to figure out, well, what's the level of measurement within each of those variables? Because that's going to determine the type of statistical test uh, that you'll be able to perform. It'll help determine the pictures that you can make visually. It'll help determine the tables that you can create. So just briefly to go through this, under categorical, we have two general buckets. We have nominal level of measurement, and that, you think about it, in name only. So that would be categories where there's no clear order. So I might have teachers, administrators, staff, and other. That's how it's measured. Uh, if you think about, you know, adults within the building of a school. Um, so that could also be race, ethnicity, anything that's, there's no clear order. You can't order it from one to what to N, um, but it's the, the order is not important, but the name is giving you the level of measurement. Uh, the second is ordinal. In that sense, you can order things. Um, so we could have dichotomous, so a no or a yes, or it's there or it's not there. We call these dummy variables. We often use those a lot. And it could be non-dichotomous. Non so it may be, you know, the frowny face, neutral, or happy. So I can put those in an order. But the difference between ordinal and interval, which is down in the quantitative scale, in general is that ordinal levels of measurement, if you think about a race, somebody running a race, you have a clear first, second, and third place, but they don't all finish within the same interval time. So it could be that the first and second place are really close, 
but then third place is way back, minutes behind even. But that won't matter. They're still first, second, and third. So if you think sometimes about our liquid, liquid scales, when we have strongly disagree to strongly agree, it may be that that movement from strongly disagree to disagree is not the same distance as moving from disagree to agree or from agree to strongly agree. So the idea is we just don't know that interval spacing. It's not equal, and it may vary by individual respondent. Now, with quantitative information on interval, it's that same sort of ordered scale, but there are equal levels of measurement between them. So in this case, we have sad to happy from 1 to 10. And I know that moving from 2 to 3 is the same distance as moving from 7 to 8 or from 9 to 10. So there's that equal spacing, or at least on the scale, for everybody, there should be that same interval um, consistent throughout. Now, what puts a ratio scale different is that there's a true zero point. So it has that ordered spacing, um, but it also moves, ha has a true zero point. So if you think about a GPA, it goes from zero to, let's say, 4.0. I know that if I get a 2.0 and next semester I get a 4.0, that I did twice as well. Um, and so that's, that's generally the, the type of ratio example that um, we can give. Another might be interval example could be Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit, where there's no true zero point, but yet we know that each degree Fahrenheit is the same distance um, versus a Kelvin scale in temperature where that, there's that true zero Kelvin. So I can say that 80 Kelvin is twice as hot as 40 Kelvin, for example, just to call back your chemistry class from high school. Okay, so now since we have a general sense of what to do once we receive that data set, how it's organized, what's its sample properties or characteristics, what are the variables that describe that sample, how are those variables measured, and there's different levels of measurement, um, then what we want to do once we have a good sense of the data set is we want to display distributions with graphs. Uh, I love Edward Tufte's quote here, above all else, show the data. And this beautiful image right here is from Aaron Koblen. He took all the flights in and out of the United States across a day just to show their trajectories and just made artwork of data, which I think is amazing. But really, I think one of the biggest things I've learned is that for me, once I receive a data set, once I understand the variables, once I know what's there um, and how it's measured, uh, pictures are the first thing I go to to start to see what my data looks like. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start our lecture thinking about once I have my sample, I know its properties, what, how can I display it with uh, graphical representations? All right, I want to start out with an example. So let's think about categorical variables. And let's say I want to examine the best-selling novels of all time. So then the question for myself is, well, if I have a list of that, I know the top 10, for example, what's the best graphical representation that I could use? Now, I've included here, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but I think this is a wonderful chart that graphically shows the types of graphs you might go to for, uh, to determine the information that you want to see. So, for example, if you, have, if you want to make a comparison between two schools, you can look in that top group, starting with the vertical uh, width and column charts and moving on through line charts if there's some time categories over few or many periods. Um, and you can see how, uh, what types of charts you might use for a comparison. Now, if you want to examine a relationship, you can use a scatter plot or a bubble chart. If you have some composition, you want to see how things break down or are composed, then you would use the charts on the bottom there. Um, and then finally, if you have some distribution, and we're going to talk about that quite a bit today, but you'd want to look at single variable histograms or two variable scatter charts and others. So this is just a helpful framework that you can go to when you're wondering, well, what's the picture that I should make. So I want you to stop as we transition to the next slide, think about what graphical display would be the most effective if I need to list the best-selling books. All right, so this was my answer. Uh, I chose a column or a which is which is always vertical. So you have a column chart or you can do a bar or horizontal chart. Um, which is great for comparing values uh, for a list of items. So here you can see, and this is maybe two years old by now, so the numbers are probably a little higher than they are here, but you can see starting with the Lord of the Rings and moving down through Life of Pi, 
this is the number of books sold in millions. And notice how I labeled my Y axis. So you know what that number means. And then with the X axis, I like to create the book cover. So it just makes it a little more visually appealing. And then I labeled each one of those bar charts above it. So you knew the exact number. So even though the lines give me a sense of roughly what the number of books in millions is sold at, I actually put the number above the bar so that you can see uh, these top 10. So I love using bar charts. The reason why you'd want to use a, uh, uh, horizontal or bar chart versus this column chart is maybe these labels um, on the x-axis here you'd want to put on the y-axis if they're kind of long so when when things are going really long or these if you're you try to put in an x-axis and it's like a teacher work uh, you know it's survey data information and it's giving you the full item and it's really hard to read that's when it's nice to flip it horizontally so it's easier to read that information so that's the difference there To build off that same idea of a column or a bar chart here, notice that I've included two different categorical variables, which are going to help me start to examine the relationships. So if you noticed in blue here, you have 50% or more of the school is uh, free and reduced lunch or marked as having poverty. Um, and then the, the maroon color here is less than 50% poverty. And then you can see when we look at school grades, so how does poor versus not poor schools, how do they perform in terms of school grade? And you can see those with uh, higher poverty uh, have an A plus NG at a rate of about 10% uh, compared to 89.9%, right? So these are all going to work within, within 100 for each of these, um, less than 50% poverty, and then those flip. So it's really nice. You can see in these bars, even though the numbers are there, I could have had a table as you see it down here. Uh, explaining the same information, but those bars really show and start to suggest that, wow, there's a strong relationship between school grade and the percent poverty uh, in our schools. All right, now this is just to further the example, <laughs> but it's really important to anchor, anchor your bar charts at zero. So notice here, and this is uh, just a graphic from Fox News. I'm not making a political statement. It just happens to be the one that I found online. Uh, but notice here, uh, Obamacare enrollment. You can imagine Fox News doesn't like Obamacare in general, ideologically. And so you can see that as of March 27th, they had 6 million enrollments. But their goal for March 31st was a little over 7 million. Um, but if you notice, this bar chart makes that difference to seem huge in fact two or three times the length of the first whereas if you were to anchor this on zero so that y-axis were to go all the way to zero it's really only about 17.8 percent greater not two or 300 times greater right and so you can see how when you're not honest in using your or anchoring on that y-axis of zero uh, that you can uh, deceive people or at least show something that disproportionately may not be there Okay, I want to do a brief aside on pie charts because in education, we use them a lot. Um, a pie chart is used to examine how the whole breaks up into its constituent parts. Often we misuse it because we get too many parts within that whole, or we're trying to draw comparisons by using a pie chart, which is not what it's for. It's used to show how things break down. So, you know, Nathan Yao here has this great graphic just showing, hey, two slices, not bad, four's okay, it's getting tricky, and then anything beyond that's like, stop it. You know, we can't see what's going on here. So the next slide is going to have a little more information around this. Okay, so notice here I have two pie charts, one from 2000 and one from 2010. Now imagine maybe that's the school that you're in, and these are the student racial ethnic demographics. And I want to see how have students changed from 2000 to 2010. Uh, what's hard about this pie chart is that it's really hard to understand the area of a pie slice and how it compares over time. So if you look at that maroon area, it's really unclear to me how that slice has changed. It looks like it got a little bigger. Uh, the red one maybe got a little bigger. I'm not sure about green or orange, right? It's really hard to see on these dimensions if you're trying to compare across time. So instead, we'd want to use a bar chart. So here you can see from top to bottom how things have changed from 2000 in the tan 
to 2010 in that maroon. And that lets you see, oh yeah, our student population has changed in this way, if that were the example. Another way is a slope chart. So one student group was high and got a little lower, another one lower and got higher, et cetera. And so you can also use a slope chart to get at that same information. But the idea is that we use a lot of bar charts and I often think they're misused. Um, Edward Tufte, who's sort of the godfather of data visualization says, bar charts are stupid and should never be used, or excuse me, pie charts are stupid and should never be used. Uh, he recommends bar charts instead. All right, I promise this is the last Fox News graphic, but just to show you, you need to respect parts to a whole. So here, talking about the 2012 presidential run, 63% back Huckabee, 60% back Rogney, 70% back Palin. That's all fine, but putting it in a pie that's supposed to equal the 100% doesn't make any sense, right? So the idea is you just need a bar chart here to show those differences, but often we run around uh, using pie charts. And then for whatever reason, we make it three-dimensional, which uh, makes it more fancy, but for me, makes it harder to read. All right, one of the most important, so we, we just talked about pie charts, how pie charts break down the whole into its constituent parts. Another way to examine within variable distributions is to think about a histogram. And we're gonna use a lot of histograms across this class, so it's good to become familiar with it. Um, a histogram breaks the range of values of a single variable into classes and displays only the counter percent of the observations that fall into each class. They provide a quick overall picture of the distribution of a quantitative variable. So when you have a single quantitative variable like a test score, think about, well, I want to see the histogram. I want to see how my students did on that test score. For example, the modes are the peaks. Those are the highest numbers in that distribution. Uh, they could be unimodal. So there's just one peak in the middle. Think of a classic bell curve just right in the middle. Uh, they could be multiple modal, right? It could be bimodal, trimodal, et cetera. So there could be more humps and valleys depending on that distribution. You could think about the symmetry. So do values on one or other side of the midpoint mirror each other? Or is there some type of skew? So is one of the tails longer than the other? Is it left skewed or right skewed? Is it positively or negatively skewed? And then you can think about those outliers. So there are in the extreme you know, if I'm looking at the overall distribution, are there any extreme outliers that are pulling, you know, shaping that distribution at all? And you can observe that uh, through a histogram. Okay, and here is an example uh, from your book, which shows uh, service time in seconds. So you can see here, they're just showing you have this you know, 7.6% of all calls are less than 10 seconds long. So you have that huge spike, then it comes down and then it kind of follows this, uh, a, a right skew or a positive skew where you're, you know, the service time dwindles down um, on that X axis. So you can see that positive or that right skew that happens um, with respect to these calls that are in. Another great um, graphical representation we can use, especially when we have data that's longitudinal, is a time plot. So time graphs, <clears throat> excuse me, these are graphs that um, plot time horizontally and the values of the variable vertically. So it can be a bar graph or a line graph. So this is an example also from your book of a line graph. So this is the retail price of gasoline in dollars from 1999, it looks like, to 2004. Uh, that seems amazingly low. I wish gas were that cheap, but you can see over time in general, the price spikes that have occurred. Um, and you might be interested historically, well, what's going on with OPEC or what's happening globally or nationally that's making these prices fluctuate? And you might put little flags that indicate, oh, you know, X, you know, embargo happened on this oil. And that's why we see a price hike here, et cetera. So uh, line, time plots are great. And this is a line chart of that time plot. Uh, to, to plot um, information over time. All right, well, this is, um, this is another way to show a time plot, but is also a bar graph form. So in the last one, we saw a line chart. This is a bar graph. Uh, this is actually work from my dissertation. And so what I'm trying to show here, and I know this, is, this has a lot of information, 
And that's what I'm trying to show is that you can layer on lots of information onto these time plots. So this was how many times does a principal log in, principals across the single urban school district log in and use their data dashboard, their data system. And so you can see in July, there's not a lot of principals using it and not using it that much. And then as school starts, you start to spike up and you can see they have a benchmark exam or teacher evaluation information comes out. So I'm trying to layer on with these discrete events to say, well, what are some relationships we might, might examine? So fall break, winter break, spring break, how does the academic calendar affect use? Are people using it more because they have time off or are they hopefully taking a much needed break? And it looks like that here, right? And so you could just start to see how even using the color Within these bars, I can shade them darker or lighter depending on how many principals are hitting the system at any given time. Uh, gives you a sense of use. Um, and so this is uh, just another way, again, to show how you can combine these plots, uh, combine these graphical charts descriptively to start to understand some of the relationships you're interested in. Now here, I think it's really important to emphasize that a lot of the graphs you're going to produce are just exploratory. They're for yourself to get a better understanding of your sample and some of the relationships that might exist there. Um, but those aren't all publication ready and they shouldn't be published. They're just so that last graphic I just showed you with the bar chart that never saw the publication light of day. Right. But that was helping me to understand where some relationships might exist or to get a better descriptive understanding of how principals were using their data system across time. Um, when you look at the graphs of others, so in evaluating graphs by others, you need to ask, well, what's the graph's purpose? How is the author, the, you know, the graphical author using this? Um, where does the visualization come from? What can I learn from it? What can I do with it? Those are good questions to ask yourself um, as you're evaluating graphical representations by others. And I think that filtering is really important. So what's information that's really exploratory for me versus what, how can I package all that into a final product that can teach others about what I'm learning? And so I think that's a helpful distinguishing uh, mechanism to think about. Okay, so where have we been? We said, well, when we receive a data set, we need to understand the level of measurement that it exists at. Are these individuals I'm looking at or schools? What are the variables that describe that unit of analysis? What's the sample size? How is that sample gathered? And then we've told ourselves, okay, what, you know, how are these variables measured? What's their level of measurement? And then how can I use graphical representation to begin to understand this sample? So I might start looking at relationships. I might start looking at some of my research questions descriptively. Uh, I may use uh, pie charts to understand how things break down from a whole to a part. I may use bar charts to begin to compare uh, across uh, different variables or categories. Um, and then I may use scatter plots or line charts or other types of graphical representation to better understand um, my data set and what I have. Having done that, though, we also know that we can use numbers. So what statistics does best, too, is collapse a lot of information to create statistics or single numbers that help describe um, a population. So measures of central tendency are usually where we start. And we, we call it averages, um, at least that's as it's described in your book. But averages include mean, median, and mode. But it's sort of like, what's the best number that gives me a sense of a set of scores or of a quantitative variable? Uh, I love these two quotes. I'm just going to read them. You can read them, but I'll read them out loud. Uh, it says, be careful of means and how they're applied. One way that they can fool you is if the mean combines samples from disparate populations. This can lead to observed observations such as, on average, humans have one testicle. Or whenever I read statistical reports, I try to imagine my unfortunate contemporary, the average person, who according to these reports has 0.66 children, 0.032 cars, and 0.046 TVs. Um, so again, thinking about kind of jokes around averages and others, but uh, the idea being here that we're trying to get to understand better these measures of central tendency. All right, so the first measure of central tendency that we're going to examine is the mean. And this may be the one you're most familiar with. This is the average, as we often say, and that's kind of the Excel function that we use. 
Um, but what I want to show you here is the Greek notation of how we get at an average, and I'll talk through it, and you can see it here on the slide as well. Um, but you probably already have in your brain what you're to do, but this includes um, some sigma notation. So uh, X bar in our course will represent the mean value of a group of scores, um, and that equals uh, the sigma, so the sum from the first individual to the nth individual, so from 1 to n, that's i equals 1 to n at the top, of their individual score. So you take the first individual score, and you're going to add it to the second individual score, and the third, et cetera, all the way to the nth in your sample. So if you have a sample of 15, you do it for all 15 people. And then you divide that by n, or the sample size, or numbers of scores that you have. Um, I finished the last slide with an um, which made you think, what do I do now? Well, you come to this slide. And this slide, what I was going to say is, here is from the Khan Academy, a brief review of sigma notation. So if you're to click this slide, um, it'll take you to it. And if anyone's uncomfortable with the sigma sign or trying to remember back to algebra class and how this works, I think it'll be good to use because a lot of our formulas will take advantage of this sigma notation and just to make things more concise and easier to summarize. So go ahead and watch this video if you need to. If not, Carry on to the next slide. All right, I think we're going to learn in class the best way to learn statistics is just to practice. So I want you to practice with the formula by finding the mean cost attendance for the following colleges and universities. Uh, I think it's best to practice by hand initially, just to work through the formula to write it out. Um, you could use a calculator, obviously, to help you do that. Uh, you could do Excel, so you could put in the numbers and put equals, average, and then select those numbers. Uh, you can use Stata, which we'll practice in class together, or some combination of any of these, right? Stata can work like a calculator, so can Excel. Um, but go ahead, take some time, find the mean cost of attendance for uh, this set of universities. Okay, so for this one, I made a slide just showing the calculation or how you get to it. So I repeated the formula here. Remember, X bar is uh, the sum of each of the individual X's over N. So I took each one of the tuition rates for each one of those colleges, divided by the N, which was 7. And in doing that math, you find that uh, the mean cost of attendance for attending these is $11,456.43, roughly. Um, so if you didn't get that, go back, rework the formula, uh, try it again, but uh, this should be the answer that you got. Okay, just to start to understand how means work, let's go ahead and recalculate the mean cost of attendance. I've added one college, Vassar College, one of the most expensive uh, colleges in the United States. Uh, to this. And so go ahead and recalculate that mean. And the next slide, we'll go ahead and compare these two means. Okay, notice what happened here. So I've added the $51,300. I've changed my sample size because I received one more institution. So instead of divided by seven, it's now divided by eight. Um, and you can see the mean cost of attendance is now 16400 and $36.88. So notice just by adding one university, my mean went from $11,456 to $16,437. So I want you to just pause and think through that and say, well, what do we learn about the means and how they operate specifically related to individual cases? In this case, uh, uh, Vassar College, which is very different than the other uh, universities and colleges. So the mean is extremely sensitive to, <laughs> it's extremely sensitive, it's a very extremely sensitive thing, no. Uh, it's sensitive to extreme values or to outliers. It's going to be pulled. So notice here we have our first set of distributions. So we have a symmetrical distribution where the mean and median are at the exact same spot. But if I have a right skewed distribution because there's more outliers on the right 
then I'm going to pull that mean to the right. It's sensitive. It's more sensitive than the median, which we're going to get to, that middle value. So it's going to get pulled right. Or if there's a left scale, this left skewed distribution, it's going to get pulled left. So outliers, means are very sensitive to outliers. And the best way, what I always think about when I'm thinking about this is the statistician Joe's <laughs> statistician's joke, which is Bill Gates walks into a diner and the average salary changes. Um, so you can imagine if our class were to give ourselves, if uh, you know, our mean or um, how much we make in income, and then Bill Gates were to walk in and we were to do the average, obviously, it would make us all seem as a group quite rich because it's so sensitive to his uh, extreme salary. I guess I should update, it should be Jeff Bezos now, but Okay, so here are a few more ways to think about this measure of central tendency, the mean. So the sample mean is this measure of central tendency that best reflects the population mean. And it's kind of like the fulcrum on a seesaw. So it's going to be the centermost point where the weight on one side is equal to the weight of the values on the other side. All right? Or it's the point about which the sum of the deviations is equal to zero. Um, that, for me at least, just reading it makes my head hurt. So I tried to provide a visual example with our table uh, to show how that works. So notice I take Tougaloo College, which is 10,600. I subtract that mean. So Vassar College is included in this one. So the mean of 16,437. And you see it's about $5,837 lower than the mean. And you do that for each one of these. And then, of course, Vassar College is going to be skewed a lot higher but the idea being that if I add up that far right column, you can see that it equals, the sum of that equals zero. And so that's the property of a mean. Those deviations, the sum of those deviations uh, from the mean from each individual value will always uh, equal zero. Okay, the second measure of central, central tendency we wanna talk about is the median. And this is the midpoint of a set of scores or the point at which one half of the scores fall above the value and one half fall below. So to do this, you just order all the values in your data set from high to low or from low to high. You find that middle score and that's the median. If the numbers happen to be even, then you just take the mean of those middle values. Um, and if the middle numbers are the same, then it's that value. That's the number that you use. All right, this is just a visual representation using a bar chart um, of the median. So it's the point at which 50% of the values are below, 50% are above, so that value itself uh, is that median. Okay, so now I wanna practice. So let's go ahead and calculate the mean cost of attendance for the following table that we had. And I want you to do it twice. I want you to do it with Vassar College and then without Vassar College or vice versa. We'll start without it and then go with it. However you want to do it, you get agency and choice. So I'm going to go ahead and write on the slide and work that out. But I want you to pause it now and then check back in with me once you've calculated that. Okay, so now I'm going to write on the slide. I can't promise this is going to go well, but I'm going to do my best. So I'm going to personally just, I'm going to draw a line under, trying to be under these to show that I have two sets. So in red, I'm going to do without Vassar, and then in a different color, I'll do with Vassar. So without Vassar, I know I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different institutions. So that makes it easy. It's an odd number. So I know if I count one, two, three, and then this will be my median at four, because then I have five, six, seven. So number four is my median. Okay, so without Vassar College, my median is 11,000. Oh man, I'm gonna try to be better, guys. I'll get better, I promise. $460. Now, because they do it in the Khan Academy so well, I'm gonna change colors and say, okay, now I'm with Vassar College. So I wanna include all eight of these. And so I know that I'm going to have eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
So now I'm stuck. It's an even number, so my median is going to be, if we remember, the average of these two numbers. So to practice our averaging, 11,460 plus 11,700 divided by our N, which is 2 in this case, and that's going to equal $11,580. So notice here, and I'm going to do it on the next slide, we'll talk through this a little bit, but notice without Vassar College, it was 11460 With Vassar College, it was 11580 All right, so what, going back now, and I'll write it down, so remember, but what is the difference between uh, the two means that we have? Um, so the two means, if you remember, the first time without Vassar College, it was 11,456, okay? And with Vassar College, it was 16,000. 437. All right. So notice the difference there. It's about $5,000 difference. Um, but then what about the medians themselves? I'm going to change color because, again, that's what they do when they're cool. All right. Uh, the two medians, we have 11,460 without Vassar College. And then with Vassar College, 11,500. Uh, I was tempted to do a four. 580. All right, if you can get past the ugly handwriting, you see here though, what do we learn about the median? Well, the median is not as sensitive to extreme values like the mean. So that mean got pulled by that Vassar College, pulled it away, um, and did a difference of about 5,000. And here we have a difference of $120 uh, for the median itself. So it's going to be less sensitive to those outliers based on its property. And if you think about how the median is calculated, that makes sense. But for us, it's important to think about, well, then when would it be a good idea to use a median versus a mean? Well, if we have any of those extreme values. So income is a great example of why we often say, what's the median household income of a neighborhood? Because it could be that you have Bill Gates living in your neighborhood, but in general, on average, you make $55,000 in that area. Now, that's not true where he lives, but you know what I mean. Uh, So the idea is that for income and other times, it may be good to choose a median over a mean, especially when you have those influential observations, those outliers. All right, the final measure of central tendency that we're gonna go over is the mode. Uh, The mode is the value that occurs most frequently in the data set. So the way to compute the mode, it's quite simple. You list all the values in the sample, but you list them only once. And then you tally the number of times that value occurs within the sample. And the one that occurs most often is the mode. Um, And you can be bimodal or trimodal. As we said, there could be multiple modes, but the idea is the most uh, recurring value. So here's an example of the roll of a die. And I'll go ahead and show you that process. It's quite simple, but we know that With uh, the roll of a die, I have six outcomes. I can get a one, I can roll a two, I can roll a three, I can roll a four, a five, or a six. So then I'm just going to tally. So I'll start with ones. It looks like I have two ones. So I'm just going to do tally marks to make it simple. Um, And I'll cross off. Look how fancy I'm getting. This is great. All right. And for twos, I have one, two... Two twos. All right, for threes, I have one three, two threes, making it easy. For fours, I have one four, two fours. For fives, I have one five, two fives. And for sixes, I have one, two, three, four sixes. Okay, so now looking at this, you could ask yourself, well, which one's the mode? Well, it's the one that occurs most frequently. So I rolled a six four times. 
So that is the mode within the sample of dice rolls that I did. Um, this asterisk that I have here is important. So the mode is the category label and not the number of times that it occurs. So sometimes we make the mistake of saying the mode, we know the mode is six here. It's the most recurring value. But sometimes we might actually report the node as four because it occurred six times. But that would put us up here. So the idea is make sure that you're using the category label to outline, uh, to indicate the mode and not the number of times that category label occurs. Okay, I want to bring together the first part of the lecture when we talked about levels of measurement and the second part, which is these level measures of central tendency here. So as I said, it's really important to know the level of measurement because that'll determine the type of statistical test or operation that you can perform on those. So now that we know about modes um, and medians and means, um, categorical data, including nominal measures of measurement, uh, ordinal interval and ratio can all be used. A mode can be used across any one of those or a count or a frequency. Um, so I can say how many students are in each uh, subgroup within my school. I might, I might also say, and the most number of that is African-American students, for example. They have the highest mode. Um, but I can't take a median of a nominal level of measurement or a mean because it's, remember, it's not ordered. But I can take the median of an ordinable, ordinal level of measurement, okay? So you have some ordinal order, and you could say, well, the, the median of that, if I have an order from 1 to 5, is 3, for example. Or if it's an even number, then it's the, the middle of those two middle values. Um, and interval of ratio, of course, I can also find the median for those. But I can't take the mean of an ordinal level of measurement. Now, I want to have one qualifier here. Often we run Likert scales from strongly disagree to strongly agree, so one through four. Now, ideally, we're going to report the counts that are within each one of those categories, and I can say what's the modal value, so do most people strongly disagree or strongly agree, so I can do those type of statistics. Often, though, we like to grab the means of those ordinal level of measurement, even though technically here, if it's ordinal and we don't know the level, uh, the, the interval distance, um, we recommend against doing that, but we do it all the time. So the idea is I live somewhere between a three and a four, right? The average response on this Likert scale from strongly disagree one to strongly agree four is 3.1. So it's somewhere between agree and strongly agree. So we do that. I just wanted to, to make you aware of that. But ideally, the means can be used for interval and ratio levels of measurement and not the lower orders. So again, the whole point of this chart, just staring at it, is just to, to remind yourself that Ooh, it's important to know what level of measurement each variable is on, just so I know which of these measures of central tendency I can. Okay, well, measures, when we're thinking about numerical representations of data, uh, measures of central tendency are really only half the story. We also want to know about the variability that exists within those measures. So variability is a measure of how much each score in a group of scores differs from the mean. It's also referred to as the spread or the dispersion. Uh, so different textbooks may use different words, but they all get at the same thing. What's that variability? What's that spread? Or how are the data dispersed around the mean? Uh, three common measures of variabilities, and the ones I'll discuss today, are the range, the standard deviation, and the variance. All right, the most general level of measurement and the easiest to calculate is the range. And that's just computed by subtracting the lowest score in the distribution from the highest score. Uh, so high minus low, and that gives you the range. And it could be inclusive, so you include that number, so you add one or not, exclusive. But either way, it's just giving you a sense of what are the bookends? What's the low and what's the high? How much spread is there from the lowest score to the highest score, but it doesn't tell us about anything that happens in between, right? It's just giving us those two ends so we know who's low and who's high.
Okay, so go ahead and take a minute and compute the range of our data set, again, with and without Vassar College. So we want to get a sense of the properties of the range. So pause it now, do that work, and then I'm going to go ahead and do it quickly on the slide. Okay, so um, if we were to calculate the range with, let's start without Vassar College, uh, we know that it's high to low, so the high score, it's already ordered for us, so the high score is here, the low score is here, and so if we subtract $12,414 from $10,600, uh, we should get $1,814. So that is without Vassar College, that's my dollar sign. Okay, I'm gonna switch colors here and now do with. We know with would be high now is Vassar College, low is still the same. And if we subtract those from each other, notice we're gonna have a difference of $40,700. All right, so Asking this question here, I sort of wrote the numbers below it, but what does this difference tell us about the range? Or what does the difference between these ranges tell us about the range as a measure of variability? Um, so if you think about means and you think about what this is telling you is that it's very sensitive to outliers. If your extreme example, in this case, we have seven institutions clustered right around $11,500, right? And then we have this stream example that's pulling it out <clears throat> uh, Vassar College, and when we look at the range itself, that variability doesn't really capture this grouping at all. It just says, wow, there's this difference of 40700 whereas when Vassar is not included, it's only about uh, $1,800. Okay, the second measure of spread or variability or dispersion that we want to look at here is the standard deviation. <clears throat> this may be something that you remember from your statistics class in high school or something that you've heard floating around a lot. Uh, so we use standard deviation quite a bit in statistics. This represents the average amount of variability in a set of scores or the average distance from the mean. So the way we calculate it is the following. Uh, I'm going to work within the operator and then I'll take the square root at the end just to explain it. So what we do is we're going to look for the deviation between each individual score and the mean. So how, how far is each score from that mean? So we're gonna do that for each one of our observations and get that answer, okay? So how far do I deviate from my mean? Um, and then we're gonna square it because you can imagine that some people are gonna be below negative and some people are gonna be above. So by squaring it, we get rid of the negative values and everything goes positive. Um, using that operator, right? So now we're squared. So it's the squared deviation from the mean. And I do that for each value. And then we notice we have the sigma sign again. So for each one of those, I'm now going to add that de square deviation up. So I take my first person, how far are they from the mean squared, add it to the second person all the way to the nth person. And once I've done that, I then divide by n minus 1. Now, we could divide by n. The, the, the difference is if we're just interested in our sample, we're not trying to extrapolate to a population, then we could just do it divided by n, and that gives us the sample information. But often we're trying in statistics to make extrapolations to a population. And so this is a correction that we do where we use a degree of freedom and say, well, really, if I knew uh, you know, n minus 1 set of scores and I knew the average, then I can backward map and have the, the last score. And so we do this correction on it so that it's the best unbiased estimator of this standard deviation. So I've done that. I've taken the deviation of each score, I've squared it, and I've added them together, and then I've divided that sum by n minus 1. But I squared everything, right? So now I want to get back to standardize it. And so what I do is I divide by, or I, I take the square root of that value, and that's your standard deviation. Okay, for me, one of the best ways to understand this formula, again, kind of like we did with the mean, is to um, play around with it. And so what I'd like you to do here, using the same set of data that we had, now I've taken out Vassar College, so we just have the original seven, uh, I want us to look at the standard deviation and to calculate it using, 
you can use, I put Excel here. You can use Google, um, for or Google sheets, something with Google, uh, that's online, but I want you to use a spreadsheet program, uh, just to go through this process individually. So the next slide will help guide you through that. Okay, this is like take four on this slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really trying to describe this process, but we will work on this in class if it doesn't make sense to you. But I think part of getting to this formula is instead of just having Stata do it, calculate it for you, it's nice to just work through the mechanics of it, um, if not by hand in an Excel spreadsheet, just to see uh, what's going on. So what I want you to do is list each score. And so for me, let's say that it would be, let me make sure this doesn't fade. Um, Let's say in A1 to A7, you have the name. In B1 to B7, you have the tuition. All right, that's going to help orient us. So in your sheet, uh, in your spreadsheet, whichever program you're using, I want A1 to A7 to have the college name and B1 to B7 to have the tuition rate, okay? And so that's, that's number one, listing each score. So then we compute the mean groups of scores. So in cell A8, I want the mean. And you'll do that by just clicking on A8 and typing in the word average. And then it's going to be B, oh, sorry. I have to fix. I don't want it in A8. I want it in B8. B8 there. So in B8, I'm going to find the average of B1 to B7. Okay. And I put that in cell B8, I hit enter, and it's going to give me that average of $11,456. Okay. So now I want you to subtract that mean 11,456 from each one of these deviations. And you're going to do that in C1 to C7. <clears throat> so now you have the deviation of each from the mean. And so that's just going to be uh, the individual value. So Tougaloo College of 10,600, subtract that 11,456. And you do that for each one of them. Okay. Then you're going to square it. And I want you to square each one of those values in D1 to D7. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to do, for example, in C1, you're going to, in D1, you're going to put C1 up carrot 2 with the, sorry, the equal sign in front. So you're telling Excel or Google Sheet, go to C2, C1, and I want you to square that value, and I want you to put it in D1. And so you'll do that for each one of those, okay? Then we're going to sum. We're going to do equals the sum of D1 to D7. Now we have the sum of all squared deviations, and then we can, wherever we put that number, then we can divide by the degrees of freedom. So N7, so 7 minus 1 is 6, okay? And then we take the square root by doing this formula equals square root of wherever we have this value. All right, and if you do that, you're going to get a standard deviation of 605.64, okay? And again, we'll go through this in class, but I kind of wanted to walk you through it, uh, but you can see the standard deviation here. Okay, now I want you to redo it, that same sort of process, but adding in Vassar College, okay? So if you were to redo that process, I'm not going to show it by hand here because I think last slide was kind of a train wreck, but it's there for you to look at, rewatch if you need it. We'll do it in class. Um, but outside of all that, if you were to really, if you were to recalculate now with Vassar College, you would find that the standard deviation uh, is equal to... 14,097.98, okay? So what do we learn about standard deviation? Well, on the previous slide, our standard deviation was $605. And now using Vassar College, we know the standard deviation is $14,097. So what do we learn? 
very similar to mean because it's in there, right? The average is in there. Um, standard deviation is very sensitive to extreme values or outliers. Okay, our third measure of variability spread or dispersion, <laughs> dispersion uh, is the variance. And the variance is just the square of the standard deviation. So it's an easy formula. You just saw it. So take away the square root sign and you have your variance calculation. All right, a lone variance is kind of a difficult measure of spread to interpret because it doesn't have the same units of measurement as the original observation because it's in squared deviation. So it's like squared tuition costs. Uh, that's why with standard deviation, we take the square root of that to get it back to those original uh, unit that we had. Um, so, you know, the standard deviations and natural measure of spread for normal distributions, which we're going to talk a lot about. Uh, especially as we think about sampling distributions in an upcoming lecture. Um, but the variance is here. It's important because we use it in a lot of statistical tests that we'll learn on later in the semester. So it's going to factor into the formulas we use in the future, but it's just good to remember that the variance is the square of the standard deviation. All right, so now we've gone back to our original um, table um, to show how the um, spread, measures of spread or variability fit into the levels of measurement that we have here. So notice that nominal levels of measurement, because there's no order, we, we don't use any measure of spread or variability to describe uh, those. But the range does come in here with the uh, ordinal levels of measurement. So I know from low to high how they range. Um, and then with quantitative measures, we get the variance and the standard deviation added onto there. So we can calculate the variance and the standard deviation uh, once the level of measurement is interval or ratio. All right, the last uh, topic I want to address today in the lecture is to talk about density curves. Density curves describe the overall pattern of a distribution, and the area under the curve and above any range of values is the proportion of all values that fall in that range. So it captures everything, and the area under that curve equals 1. So here you have two examples from your textbook, rainwater pH values, survival time in days, and notice that the red overlaying the histograms, those are the density curves. All right, to connect it back to measures of central tendency, which we did a little bit of, but if just to kind of put a fine point on it here, you can see how the measures of ten central tendency change or are moved depending on the type of density curve that we have. So a symmetrical density curve, the mean and the median are going to be the same. And in fact, the mode too, right? That's the modal value, it's the median value, and it's the mean value right in the middle when it's a symmetrical normal distribution. Now on the right, we have this positive skew. So it goes out, has this kind of long tail on the right. And you can see, and we said, means are very sensitive to those outliers or those observations. And so it's going to get pulled to the right of the median when there's a positive skew. And as we said before, the opposite's going to happen when there's a uh, negative skew. The mean's going to get pulled to the left toward those observations. Uh, this visually just represents what I mentioned earlier, and, but thinking about it with density curves is that the mean is that fulcrum point, okay? So it's the density curve, it's the point at which the density curve would be balanced. And so here, this far left graphic, you can see that fulcrum point, the weight's too far on the left, so it's, it's flopping down, so we would have to adjust the fulcrum left. If we go too far left on the blue line, then it's going to flop right, and so that mean's going to be that fulcrum measure where everything's in balance. The weight on one side is equal to the weight on the other. All right, you are going to get sick of the normal curve because we are going to live with it so much because a lot of the statistical tests upon which we base 
our inferences come from properties of a normal distribution. So let's live with it for just a little longer, um, even though we haven't lived with it very long. We're just going to keep living with it. Uh, anyway, the normal curve represents a class of curves that they're symmetric, they're unimodal, so they have one mode, and they're bell-shaped. So this is the classic bell curve that we often think about. Uh, they're defined by a mean mu, and that we're going to use that mu to represent the population mean, and a standard deviation of sigma. And notice how the sigma controls the spread or the standard, you know, the, the variability of the normal curve. So here you have a larger sigma on the left, and the, the, the distribution's more spread out, whereas a smaller sigma is going to make it tighter. So it's important to think about that. When it's not as spread out, you get a tighter distribution, though these are both normal, they're unimodal, and they're symmetrical. All right, one of the great benefits of a normal distribution with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma is the following property, that 68% of the distribution lies within one standard deviation or one sigma of the mean mu. 95% lies within two sigmas of the mu or the mean. And 99.7 lives within three sigmas of that mu. Okay, so we're going to capitalize on this rule, the 68.95.99.7 rule uh, in statistics a lot uh, as we think about uh, the inferences we'd like to make especially moving from a sample to a population. So that's going to be the next few weeks, next few lectures, I should say, uh, thinking about how we capitalize on this property to know something about the distribution. All right, let's do a practice problem. Losing the normal curve and what we just learned from the 68, 99.7 rule. So the question here is, well, what percent of these scores, these raw scores, fall between 80 and 120? And we can see that these test scores, they're symmetrical, they're uh, centered about a mean, and they're unimodal. So we know this is a normal distribution that we have here. So um, I am going to go ahead and say we want to know what falls between 80 oh, and 120. Now, we know that within one standard deviation of the mean, we're going to have 68%. That was a terrible eight. I'm sorry. 68% of the scores. And we know that two standard deviations are going to contain 95% of the scores. So that's a property of a normal distribution. And so since 80 and 120 are two standard deviations, wow, that's bad, I'm sorry. Two standard deviations or two sigmas above and below, then my answer is 95. 95% of scores are going to fall between 80 and 120 on this distribution. All right, let's finish this off with one more example, and then we'll practice a lot once we're in class together. Um, so here we have the normal curve and the IQ distribution. So you can see Albert Einstein, he's very smart. He's on the extreme outlier right and the far end of the distribution high. Um, but let's say you have a student that comes up to you and she said, hey, I just took an online IQ test, and I found that I'm at the 115. So where do I stack up in the world? And you have this normal distribution knowing that IQ is distributed normally. Uh, about the mean. And the mean on the IQ and the median is uh, 100 right here in the middle. And she's here at 115. So she wants to know how, what percent of the population lies below where she is here in the mean. Well, we know that 50% of the population lies below this median or mean. So we have 50% that is left of the median or the mean in this case, since it's a normal distribution, those are the same values. But she's up here at 115. 
So she's one standard deviation above the mean. And so here, what this graphic's telling us is that 34% of the population fall one standard deviation above the mean. So in order to calculate the what percent fall below her, we take the 50% and we're going to add the 34% and we would get 84% of the population lives below her. I don't know why I said the word lives, but that's where they would test. Okay. So that was how you can use the normal distribution to find out these percentile ranks. So we can use the properties of those to figure that out. So to summarize this lecture, uh, we started with what do you do when you get a data set? Um, and we talked about how you can understand a data set by understanding its level of measurement and the variables and how they are measured and their levels of measurement. So how, what are the characteristics that describe and the attributes that describe those variables? And then we capitalized on knowing that and saying, okay, well, knowing that I can do graphical representations, different kinds to understand my data. And I can also do numbers. Uh, measures of central tendency are amazing because they help me summarize uh, large sets of information down into one number. But I also know that just that single measure of central tendency also is only half the story. I want to know the spread or the variability as well. So we talked about range, standard deviation, and variance. And capitalizing on all of that, we said, well, the normal curve is really important because it can tell us something about the distribution of a property. And a lot of the things we observe in the world actually fall into a normal distribution. So we'll talk about more of that in next lecture.